Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to uh, this uh, event, Engineering Distinguished Lecture. My name is Furuzan Golshani, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this event. We are now in our ninth year uh, hosting uh, these uh, lecture series. Uh, topics have been centered around uh, those challenges that uh, the National Academy of Engineering identified some years ago for the engineering community. These events uh, are recorded and uh, you're welcome to search for uh, prior lectures on YouTube or uh, just go to the college website and you will see uh, the events of prior years, all of them interesting and exciting uh, events. These lectures are organized by the Engineering Dean's Advisory Council and a subcommittee of uh, the council consisting of uh, Michael Nigley, uh, Charles Gustafson, Rolando Saldana, Matt Petrim, and Parviz Parhami organized this lecture. We are grateful for their hard work. Other members of the Dean's Advisory Council who are present, uh, and we uh, are thankful for their participation, uh, Nestor Martinez, Bob Spidel, Mike Bagramian, Tom Croslin, Rudy Duran, Matt Rezvani, and Arnold Hackett. Thank you for your continued support to the college. Sponsors for this uh, lecture uh, today are AES, P2S Engineering, Port of Long Beach, and Michael and Linda Nigley. We are grateful for their support. We have a few special guests that I'd like to acknowledge. My colleague and friend, Kurt Bennett, Curtis Bennett, Dean of Science and Math is here. Uh, Simon Kim, AVP of uh, Research for the University. Jeet Joshi, Dean of uh, College of Continued Education and also uh, Associate Vice President for International Programs. Uh, also, uh, Jody, I saw Jody Cormack just walked in, uh, Vice Provost uh, in charge of uh, graduate programs. I hope I'm not missing anyone. And it is so great to have uh, uh, one of our best, Mr. Scott Sharmack, coming back to us. He retired as the uh, AVP of Physical Planning and Facilities Management uh, uh, some now probably 10 years. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm particularly pleased to introduce our uh, provost, uh, Brian Jersky, uh, who uh, will welcome you on behalf of the university. Uh, within a year, just over a year here, he has impacted many, many initiatives on our campus, uh, all centered around student success and improving the quality of uh, educational services that the, this university provides. As a data scientist and statistician, uh, we consider him very close to engineering, an honorary engineer, and he has certainly provided all the support that we need in everything we do. Please welcome Provost Jersky. Thanks for the kind introduction, Furuzan. I'm always delighted to be uh, classified as a semi-engineer, at least. Uh, on behalf of uh, the President Connolly, I'm delighted to welcome you to this, the ninth lecture already in this distinguished series. I'd like to thank the uh, advisory board for their support and advice. And of course, I'd also like to thank uh, the distinguished panelists for taking the time. Uh, in particular, I'd like to just mention the wonderful students I've had the pleasure of meeting. Uh, each one was more impressive than the next, and uh, it was truly a delight to see how wonderfully the uh, dean and his college are training the engineers of the future. Uh, so I know that you are waiting to hear about robots, and I just wanted to let you know that in spite of reports to the contrary, I am not a robot, uh, but I do have the accent of a robot. And so uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome you. I'd like to thank the Dean for his leadership of the college in this and other ways he proves himself to be at the forefront of engineering in Southern California and beyond. So thank you, Dean Golshani. Thank you for attending and enjoy the conference.
Thank you, Provost Jersky. And uh, as I said, we are uh, very, very grateful for all the support that uh, uh, our college, just as the rest of university, uh, receives from the provost office. Thank you. And on to the main event. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, our moderator uh, for today's event, uh, Rolando Saldana. Uh, he is a vice president of engineering for Qualcomm, where he leads, among many other activities, cybersecurity solutions design division, uh, leads uh, that has uh, 200, 250 engineering team. Previously, he was a senior director of engineering for Qualcomm uh, in the ASIC hardware reference design organization, and before that with the satellite hardware systems uh, in TRW and also Northrop. I'm very pleased and very proud that Rolando is a Beach alum and received a master's degree in electrical engineering from the Beach in 1992. Please welcome Rolando Saldana. Thank you very much, Dean. And uh, first and foremost, I, I'd like to say that I'm extremely proud to be here standing in front of you uh, 25 years after graduating uh, with my master's from, from this uh, great school. And also, I wanted to um, introduce you to the topic. The topic today is about automation, robotics, artificial intelligence, and all the things that I think we all live with today, every single day. And if you think you're not being impacted positively or otherwise by automation, I think you'd be mistaken. I think we all understand that your coffee maker uh, has artificial intelligence in it, uh, your washer, your refrigerator. Going forward, we're also seeing that industry is adopting at great rates the ability to automate their processes, the ability to put the human in a different circumstance than they had been in the long past. And so I think this is one of those topics that I think is very pertinent to our daily lives. And I am honored to have a group of panelists that are actually living it. They are the folks who are actually putting together these systems that are dealing with the consequences, again, positively or otherwise, of all these changes. So today's uh, lecture is going to be about achievements in robotics, automation, and what kind of impact this is having on our workforce. And what you're going to hear is from three different industry experts in the area. Uh, first and foremost, there'll be uh, Mr. Bert Vermeer uh, from uh, Moffat Nichols. And he's actually responsible for one of the largest scale automation systems that you'll ever find, right? Heavy duty stuff that happens at the port. Um, we also have uh, Nicholas Wild, who's from Applied Medical. And he'll give us a different perspective of how automation and robotics works in a very different industry. Not heavy duty, lighter duty, but yet not less important. Because again, these are medical devices that go embedded into people's bodies. So it's important as well. And last but not least, you'll hear from Mr. Rudy Duran out of Boeing. Somewhere in between. Super heavy stuff, light stuff, and there are airplanes who are light and than uh, the, some of the items that uh, Bert has to deal with. So you're going to hear a variety of perspectives. Each one of them very interesting. Each one of them very pertinent, again, to our daily lives. And one of the things that I want you to think about is what impact is it having on you? What impact is automation having on each one of us as workers? And what does that mean for the future of our workforce? And uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Bert. Vermeer, he's a senior manager for technical automation for uh, Moffat Nickel. He has nearly 20 years of experience in the area of um, project management and business, and specifically an expert in the area of automating ports, and has worked for at least 15 years in this area. So I'd like to welcome Mr. Vermeer uh, to give us a brief of, from his standpoint, what does automation and uh, robotics looks like. Thank you. It's uh, really uh, a pleasure to be here. And uh, I know it's uh, 
maybe uh, has been a long day, uh, so uh, bear with me. Uh, it's indeed a heavy industry, but I hope to bring it more crisp and light than the industry is. We Today I'd like to talk about uh, robots in the port, uh, robots in marine terminals, and how to lift this industry to the next level. But before stepping into uh, what it means to have robots in the port, I want to flash back a little bit and see and look into um, the era where even the container didn't exist. Where are we coming from? Uh, before the container was introduced in the uh, late 50s of uh, the last century, it was all about brake bulk in the ports. So there was a numerous variety of crates and nets and pallets uh, where all the stuff was stuffed in put on and um, it means that in the ports vessels were loaded and discharged uh, with a lot of manpower and you can imagine that that was hard and dangerous work. Um, it was also a very inefficient and slow process. And you can also imagine that with the handling of goods that were um, packaged in various ways, the goods were vulnerable and it was very easy to damage the goods. And last but not least, since the fact that there were many hands uh, very close to the goods, it was easy to uh, steal or, or, or commit fraud with the... Um, with the goods. So that all changed when the container was introduced. And it was really here in the US that two companies pioneered with steel boxes uh, and they stuffed uh, goods into the steel boxes and shipped it uh, to the places where uh, they want to move the goods to. And the co sea container that we have today, the pendant of that is from 1958. But as with much of the um, new developments, the real, let's say, push uh, came by uh, the army, in this case the US Army, that adopted uh, this standardized container in the early 70s in their logistics. And that really boosted the industry. And when you look at the graph on the, uh, for your right side, you see that in 1980, the volume uh, in um, Metric tons was about 100 million tons that was shipped around the world. That's the equivalent of like 5 million uh, seagoing containers. And in 35 years, it went up to almost 1,800 million ton or the equivalent of um, 85 million containers. So the container itself uh, did, I think, uh, a couple of things with this world. I think it is one of the pillars on the globalization because with the container um, and the standardization of, of shipping of goods, the logistics costs become marginal. And with that, it was no longer an issue where you produce your goods and where you consume your goods because if the logistics go to, uh, let's say, marginal part of the price, it doesn't matter where you produce or where you consu uh, consume. However, when we look at the uh, development of, uh, of shipping container terminals, there are three uh, major challenges uh, that uh, needs to be addressed uh, in the current operations, in the current terminals of today. So the first thing is about um, productivity and predictability of um, the operation. Um, with the increase of volumes, also the vessel sizes increased dramatically. And if you look uh, in the um, vessel sizes depicted on the right, and you just go back, let's say, 10 years, you see in 2006, the biggest vessel was around 10,000 TU. And then TU is the uh, standard measurement for uh, containers. It stands for 20-foot equivalent unit, and it means one 20-foot container. So 
if I'm talking about containers and TU, forgive me, but I mean, I'm, I just meant to be uh, to talk about containers. So, in 2017, if you look at the largest vessel out today, they are already doubled in size, and uh, shipping companies make their money with sailing their vessels and not with having their vessels idle in port. So their demand is that despite the increase in vessel size, the increase in coal size, the number of containers that will be loaded and discharged, their demand is to improve productivity. The other major topic that needs to be addressed is safety. Today, in the uh, conventional terminals that are operating around the world, safety is an issue. And you can imagine, we talked about, let's say, in heavy industry, if you look at uh, what's happening in conventional terminals, container terminals, you have people and heavy machinery, uh, suspended loads, and you have them all in a close proximity. People, man and machine, are not separated. They are mixed in that operation. And that in itself, by design, is dangerous. Of course, safety is about people. Nobody wants to have a job nobody where there is a risk to be injured or even worse, right? But safety for companies is absolutely, in, a, in the US, but in many other countries as well, it is also about your license to operate. If you don't care for your people, you will run into pro trouble by is it by uh, because of, of regulations? But at the end of the day, nobody will accept um, fatalities in your operation. Sustainability. Uh, that's another topic that needs to be addressed and is really hot, uh, in particular here in California, in particular here with the Port of LA and, L uh, and, and Long Beach with their initiatives. Um, but it all starts with, with us. I mean, we as a society, we want to live in a safe place, we want to live in a nice place, and we want to breathe clean air. That's what, what, where it starts with. And of course, regulators, port authorities, they listen to the society, they hear their voices, and it will be translated into a push into applying cleaner technologies, uh, reducing emissions in the ports, uh, but also to um, uh, make sure that, that the resources, like the San Pedro Bay here, will be used uh, more efficient, because it is a fact that as human beings, we, tend to still, we, st we, we still tend to consume more and more, but we have to make sure that what we do is that we do it more efficient, so to make sure that we um, um, reduce the uh, uh, our, our footprint and make sure that we reduce emissions. But also for the terminal operator, it is important because when we talk about being energy efficient, when we talk in general about, let's say, an efficient utilization of your assets, we're talking about cost efficiency. And for a company, I mean, that makes, uh, that, that's very clear, cost efficiency is, is a very important driver. So, I believe that um, when you want to lift the industry to the next level, and when we talk about container terminals, that um, predictable productivity, a safer workplace, and a, more and a more sustainable workplace can be addressed by using robots in the port. Before we, we start seeing um, and looking at, at, at robotization, just a very brief uh, way of uh, looking at the process. This is a cross-section of a container terminal. On the, far, on the far right, you see the vessel. Um, then um, the vessel is handled by a ship-to-shore crane. So that's the STS. Then uh, the horizontal transport, so from the, v from the crane 
to the container yard uh, is done with AGVs, automated guided vehicles, robots. And then the stacking and the, the handling within the yard is uh, done by the automated rear mount, mounted gantry crane, an ARMG. And then on the other side, the handling of the over-the-road truck, the OTR, is again done using the ARMGs, so that you have a kind of idea of the process of a terminal. It's quite straightforward, but just to show you that. The future is already here today. Here in the port of Long Beach, Long Beach Container Terminal realized the fully automated LBCT facility. Um, it is a, the first fully automated container terminal um, here in the US. It um, has a capacity of uh, 3.2 million TU. And forget about that, but it's just say, saying that it can handle two of the largest vessels simultaneously each and every week. And that's what's happening here. When we look at automated vessel handling, so that's the first step in the process, um, we have a ship-to-shore crane. And the ship-to-shore crane is where the technology is today is for 90% automated and robotized. So it is still controlled by an operator, but it is no longer, let's say, a typical crane driver, but it is really a process operator. And um, not in the case of, of uh, Long Beach, but in other terminals, um, the crane dri uh, operator is no longer with the crane, at the crane, but the crane is remotely monitored and operated. So for a, from a safety uh, perspective, you can, but also from a well-being perspective, perspective, this is really a major difference where you have operators now in an office environment, they are safe, they are no longer directly exposed to vibrations, noise, um, and with that, um, they are in a safer, environment now. In the yard, um, currently the state is that all yard equipment is robotized. So the horizontal transport is no longer done with trucks, but is replaced by automated guided vehicles. No human errors, so uh, improved safety. Vehicles are fully electric, they are battery powered. Um, no local emissions, and you have smoother movements, so you have no accidents because simply there is no one there to hit. But the goods are, of course, um, more protected now because all movements are controlled by um, process automation instead of humans. And there is simply less noise because operations go smooth. Stacking of containers is also done by robots. So the cranes operate autonomous in the yard. Again, nobody is in the yard anymore. So man and machine are separated. And with that, of course, you eliminate the chance of, um, uh, of accidents. Again, also this equipment is electrified. So you don't have any local emissions. And here in this animation, you, you see the operations, the AGVs in the front, bringing the containers from the STS to the um, ARMG. The ARMG drives into the stack. It will stack the containers. And by the way, there is, of course, a lot of process automation with algorithms to optimize the, uh, the decking and make sure that containers are stacked in an optimal way. So to, con to conclude, 
Um, with robots in the port, you create an environment where there is a safe place to work, and you also create an environment with more attractive jobs. Of course, by automating jobs, there will be a shift where you have less operators, but you have more people who maintain software, who maintain vehicles, who are working to support this um, more advanced industry. With robots in the port, you will have a cleaner environment. Uh, as, I, as I said, all equipment that handles the, the containers is electrified. It has either electrif it's, it's electrified from the grid or using battery power. And last but not least, with automating the process and using robots, you get a more efficient and a more predictable operations. And as you could see, the future of automated terminals is already here in Long Beach. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Bart. Really appreciate it. And once again, a, a, an interesting perspective from uh, one of our uh, industries, very local industry. Uh, next up is going to be uh, Mr. Nicholas Weil. He's a director of, of, at Applied Medical. Um, Applied Medical designs, manufactures, and distributes medical devices. The company's focus on making a meaningful, positive difference through creating efficiencies and effectiveness that enhance clinical outcomes while reducing the cost of healthcare and increasing its availability. Uh, Mr. Rao has been with Applied Medical for almost eight years, holding various positions in the automation department. His current responsibilities have been managing the automation mechanical design team within Applied Medical. He holds a BS uh, degree in mechanical engineering from Cal Poly and uh, married with Cynthia, his wife, uh, leaves local as well, South Orange County. So uh, welcome, Mr. Wild. Please come on up. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Rolando, for having me at this Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, I will be talking to you today about uh, the impacts of service robotics in a manufacturing environment, uh, specifically at Applied Medical. Um, my name is Nicholas Wild, um, so I'm the Director of Mechanical Design um, in our automation department. And first, I'll be going to speaking to you about uh, Applied Medical. Um, so we are a vertically integrated um, medical device manufacturing company um, located in Southern Orange County. Uh, we design and manufacture everything uh, locally. Uh, we've been in business for 30 years and we um, mainly focus on uh, medical devices used during uh, minimally invasive uh, surgery, uh, such as uh, laparoscopic surgeries. Um, we've, we're founded on a mission to deliver uh, quality and value to our customers and uh, we're um, based on a vertically integrated uh, business model. And what I mean by vertically integrated is that we bring all of our manufacturing processes uh, in-house. Um, so we do anything from plastic injection molding, uh, metal stamping, um, we do uh, plastic extrusion, uh, we do automated assembly, uh, we do punching, uh, there's all, you name it, uh, we bring it in-house and we do it. So with that, we have um, large uh, support teams to be able to support uh, all of these manufacturing processes. Um, so our main device that we concentrate on is uh, what we call our trocar. Um, it is a medical device that is used to create a pathway uh, into the body uh, for laparoscopic instruments such as scissors, graspers, uh, and cameras. And what's important to note is that the trocar uh, creates a seal um, so that the surgeon can actually uh, blow up the abdomen to create room to be able to uh, perform uh, that laparoscopic surgery. So 
Um, at Applied Medical, uh, we view automation as an integral part of our device design. Uh, we think about it from the very beginning. Um, so our device design engineers, uh, they get together with the automation team um, and uh, we add small but very crucial features to our product from the very beginning. Um, it allows us to create processes during our manufa uh, while manufacturing that uh, create more repeatable, um, more sustainable, uh, it's more consistent, um, as well as being safer uh, for the employees. So this here is our uh, key seal. Um, it's a sub-assembly of the trocar that I was speaking to you about earlier. Um, we first started manufacturing it in the 1990s. Um, and we, when it was first being manufactured, it was done by just a um, small uh, amount of team members that was uh, using an arbor press um, all day long. I mean, can you imagine um, every 15 seconds, you know, pulling down on an arbor press, you know, for eight hours a day? Uh, it'd get really tiring. Um, and then we also do, um, or they, they were also manually leak testing um, the key seals to make sure that they were functioning properly. Um, and they would have to manually read a gauge um, all day, you know, which for me would get uh, extremely tiring um, to be able to take a look at that. So um, in stepped the automation team and we created uh, our key seal um, assembly machines. Um, so what it automatically does, it, or what it does is it automatically uh, assembles our key seals. Uh, so it's, uh, each machine has about seven robots. Uh, we have one, uh, it, altogether we make one million parts a month. Um, and it was developed through um, a large team collaboration. So we had um, a whole engineering team on the automation side that had to design uh, the machine. We had um, a whole team of technicians that had to assemble the machine. Uh, we have a whole other set of team that actually have to operate uh, the machines, um, as well as um, a whole other set of teams uh, for maintenance. Um, so just because we implement you know, the, these automated pe uh, pieces of automated equipment uh, doesn't necessarily mean that we are removing jobs. We are actually creating jobs. Um, we've hired about 400 uh, jobs just this year alone. So we're growing very quickly and very rapidly, and automation uh, allows us to do that. Um, with this automation, it, uh, it allows us to produce more uh, with the same amount of team members. So like with this key seal assembly machine, we're using the same uh, team members that were manually producing it to uh, produce um, even more uh, with the same number. Um, and at Applied Medical, uh, we really uh, view that, um, or they really concentrate on developing the teams um, and not necessarily uh, developing uh, the technologies themselves. Uh, this is really crucial and really important to us. Uh, we really believe in it. Um, it's the core to who we are because um, it, it allows us to give that value back uh, to our customers. So in terms of the social impacts, it's like, well, doesn't automating this equipment, you know, remove jobs, remove the manufacturing jobs? Um, the answer is actually no. Uh, what we do at Applied is we take these team members who are manufacturing our devices and we can do a bunch of different things. Um, one is we can move them to an infant product line. Uh, that is not necessarily ready to be automated yet, so they can help with the R&D side of stuff and kind of get that, those lines up and running. Uh, we can also um, develop these uh, team members to actually operate our machines. Uh, so they're going from a role where they're manually assembling these parts to a more technical role where they're operating these you know, complicated machines. Um, and so we really believe in developing these team members, you know, to be able to do this. Now, this graph that I'm showing here uh, on the right-hand side is showing um, in the light green, it's our production team members for one of our product lines. And, it sh and the other uh, line is um, showing the amount of products uh, that we are producing uh, uh, per year. 
And as you can see, like the number of team members is, is steady and we're pr actually producing uh, more, um, producing more products with the same number of team members. Now, this doesn't show like all the support team members that we have, right? Like I mentioned earlier about the maintenance, about um, the operators that need to operate the machines, as well as you know the design engineers, you know that actually design the machines, um, and then also by automating um, uh, our manufacturing line, we're able to keep jobs local, which is really important, right? So if um, but keeping them local, uh, what it allows us to do is to be more nimble in the market. So like, say we had a design change that needed to happen you know, on a product, uh, we are able to quickly react. We are able to um, have our device design engineers you know, design up what needs to be done, and then just go you know, across the street to the next building where our manufacturing is, and see, okay, how can we actually implement you know, uh, this thing, or uh, this, this design change? Um, so it's really crucial that our, uh, we can keep the manufacturing here. Um, and the way that we do that is through automating uh, a lot of our processes. So we have a case study. Uh, we have a team member named Steve Nguyen. Uh, so he started out um, uh, manually assembling those, uh, those key seals that I was talking about earlier. Um, and then once our, our key seal assembly machine came online, uh, he was actually um, developed into being able to run these machines. And from there, he actually became a liaison uh, between us engineering team as well as, you know, our maintenance team, you know, trying to you know, give us feedback as to how are these machines running? You know, or did we do this okay? You know, is there anything that we can improve upon? Maybe make some upgrades to the machines later on? Um, and currently, he is a, a local team lead um, in our production line uh, that's overseeing the entire thing. Now, Stephen Nguyen is just one of many examples that we have at Applied Medical of people that we've um, brought up through our production line um, and developed them into other areas in Applied Medical. So some other examples is we had a team member that was helping uh, us automation team run our machines uh, for testing, and uh, she came over and is now leading projects in our automation team. You know, we found out that she had that skill, and we really wanted to utilize it. Um, another one is we found out that an, uh, one of our production team members had a civil engineering degree, and we actually brought him over to our facilities team, uh, and he's now you know help planning you know some of our future buildings in Rancho Santa Margarita. So um, um, we really you know concentrate on taking our team members, developing them, and bringing them into a whole bunch of different teams within Applied Medical. Right? It's really important. So in summary, we have our economics, uh, economic impacts of uh, automation. Uh, we, it influences the design of our product you know, from the very beginning. Um, that way we can think about it ahead of time um, and on how we're gonna automate this thing you know, by adding small and crucial features to our product. Uh, we are also able to reduce the manufacturing cost by automating, which allows us to keep the jobs local. Um, and it also, um, yeah. And then some of the social impacts is uh, it improves actually um, ergonomics and safety for our team members. So very similar uh, to what Bert was talking about, where uh, we are making sure that our team members are doing it in the most ergonomic manner, um, so they're not doing a repetitive motion all the time, um, as well as providing safety for them and those uh, those around them during the manufacturing processes. Um, we are also able to keep jobs you know local here, um, so you know we don't have to ship them overseas. And then, uh, and also, we it allows us to have our team members pursue other options within the company if they want to go to uh, other teams. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Very, very interesting and uh, very much having to do with uh, our health, uh, something that I think we're all having an interest in keeping. Uh, but also important to note is the fact that part of what Applied Medical has been trying to do is to keep jobs locally and to keep jobs within. This is extremely important to all of us that, that live in the Southern California area and actually are involved with this school. Uh, next up, and last but not least, uh, Mr. Rudy Duran. 
Uh, Rudy is a director of engineering at Boeing, uh, commercial airplanes in, uh, here in Southern California. He is at the uh, Engineering Design Center, and he's responsible for the uh, core BCA engineering organization uh, in Southern Cal, as well as the engineering skill leader across the BCA of uh, Southern California. Perhaps uh, Rudy can explain what BCA is and then kind of lead us into his slides. Okay, thank you, Rolando. BCA, Boeing Commercial Airplanes. Hopefully that wasn't going to be one of your questions tonight. I uh, appreciate the introduction, and thank you very much, Dean Golshani, uh, for having me here, the Cal State Long Beach engineering staff and the student body. Uh, extremely interesting topic to talk about. Automation, machine learning, artificial intelligence, those roles that those new technologies play in our industry, and what does that mean on the social side from a workforce perspective? So it's a great opportunity to have a conversation. I by no means am an expert in any of those fields per se, but uh, I do have a sense of where Boeing is headed and how we deal with that social aspect of our workforce as those technologies grow, particularly in our existing markets, as well as those developing and uh, new disruptive markets that are popping up each and every day. So I'm going to uh, frame the dialogue a little bit. I'm going to uh, show you some real quick examples of what we deal with uh, from a product perspective, also from a workforce perspective, and then I'll share with you some viewpoints of what Boeing is doing to, uh, to really build up the workforce going forward. Uh, our enterprise vision is to connect, protect, explore, and inspire. And those are not just about our products, but those deal with our people as well connecting our people to the right technology and the right data to have them do their job effectively, protecting our people to ensure that they go home the same way they showed up to work each and every day, to explore new opportunities for them to become more efficient and to inspire them to really grow and innovate going forward in the competitive environment that we're in. And that is a very nice little picture of an autonomous airplane. Uh, right now, it's, uh, there's no people in there. And uh, we're exploring that market space along with a whole bunch of other people about what that looks like. We've heard from Bart and from Nicholas about the uh, advantages of automation and robotics. The same apply in the aerospace industry. Very predictable, very repeatable processes. Uh, aerospace in some areas overall, a little more complex products. So to make repetitive, automated, uh, automated uh, pieces of machinery, it takes some time to be able to ensure that you've got standard processes, integrated systems that all know how to work together going forward. So we'll typically integrate and automate on development programs before we include them into a more repeatable uh, production line where we deliver airplanes, much like the automotive industry. We've had some uh, major commercial aerospace inflections over the years. Boeing just turned 100 years this last year, and we're excited about our next century. Over these past 100 years, we've seen lots of fantastic new technology and automation pop up, and we've reacted and responded to that. Uh, in the 1950s, the advent uh, of the jet engine, which brought, of course, the jet age going forward and, and moving very comfortably over vast range of uh, territory uh, and flying very comfortably uh, for the public and making it very affordable. Throughout the 60s and the 70s, we brought in automation through computer technology. So we integrated the cockpit. We were able to go in some cases from a five crew per flight uh, uh, configuration down to two. And so through all the systems and automation that took place, all that data and information got brought together, which reduced workload for the crew and were able to reduce that. That brought in effective uh, airline management for the airlines to be able to schedule their pilots better. In the 80s and the 90s, significant improvement with gen engines and the engine reliability that allowed us to make configuration changes for twin engines to go over vast distances and cross great bodies of water. Again, more flexibility to the airline in a competitive environment. Today, as we begin our second century of Boeing, we're once again at a very key inflection point. Uh, the time, the technology drivers 
of the future and our industry, uh, not necessarily are developed within our aerospace community. We're going to find those outside of that aerospace community. Instead, the rapid introduction of artificial intelligence uh, into an increasingly complex and autonomous system will create entirely new transportation markets that we have yet to see, and it's going to have a profound impact on how we look at life each and every day. I want to show you and share with you just some really quick examples and some illustrations of uh, what autonomous flight operations would look like. You saw the picture at the beginning. Uh, predominantly right now, there's still a big significant debate on whether or not we're ready to remove the human element out of the cockpit when it comes to commercial airline passengers. But certainly when you talk about the freight hall market, uh, that is a conversation that is quite alive and well today. And you can see all the different elements of a flight from taxi to takeoff to flight uh, in route operations, landing, automatic unloading and loading, uh, reduced crew operations, and then managing and optimizing that fleet over uh, long hauls and long period. Very attractive market, and it has to deal with the fact, and it's a well-known fact, that in our current traditional commercial markets today, over the next 20 years, we are going to see a significant pilot shortage. Uh, we just can't train them fast enough. Uh, the source of pilots, a lot of them coming from the military, they can't keep the pilots trained fast enough as well. So we're going to have to deal with this problem, this critical skill, in some way, shape, or form. So why not take a look at the freight haul industry and being able to autonomize that and then move pilots over to other areas that are in critical need. Also taking into effect is uh, autonomous ground systems. So when you land at a particular airport, there is a lot of activity surrounding what we do to prepare uh, airplanes to be able to get ready to move. And we've been collaborating with NASA along with other organizations and companies to figure out how to automize that entire system of systems. When it comes to de-icing, when it comes to loading and unloading, when it comes to fueling, uh, all those elements we are taking a look. Uh, tug connections to the uh, hubs themselves and the gates. All that is being taken a look at from an uh, in, uh, automated system. We not only deal with products each and every day that we deliver for autonomy and robotics, but it also affects on how we build the products in our factories. Implementation challenges still exist on some of the complexities uh, that we often, uh, uh, that we deal with such that some of those robotics are even more complex than the product, that, uh, the program and product itself. Many systems and processes have to be integrated and validated, which again is much easier to do that in a development state rather than uh, putting it into a full-fledged production state. So there will have to be a transition going forward. This continues to be an ongoing opportunity for ourselves at Boeing and other industry leaders as well right along with, the, with that aspect of how do you deal with the people strategy? What does that look like when you start introducing robotics and building airplanes going forward? So knowing that environment we have to compete in and the vision and the strategy that we need to implement, uh, how do we integrate and blend that developing technology, that disruptive technology, along with our skilled workforce? So the steps we're taking at Boeing, First step, of course, is to understand the complexity of the drivers, the rapidly changing technology, and it changes each and every day, and the new entries that disrupt the markets that we know of today that will define the new markets going forward. From a skilled labor perspective, we have already established partnerships in both the states of Washington and California where we have most of our commercial activity, and we are partnering with local and state government agencies uh, to assist in retraining to get our people taking a look at a new skill set, either coupled with automation or another part of our, of our factory that requires that aging skill set to be replaced going forward. This is necessary, but it's a reactive step. Proactively, we continue to collaborate with workforce representation and local and trade and even high schools, going back to get up in front of this to lead the understanding of automation and how to best prepare that future workforce for that new factory element. Boeing Executive Partnerships, uh, we enjoy a fantastic partnership with Cal State University Long Beach uh, to be able to, uh, and other key engineering business schools so that we can uh, 
we can form those partnerships to, to gain and prepare a strategy for students going forward uh, to ensure that we have the needs met for the next century of work. Critical skill and critical thinking, digital engineering transformation and data analytics, the use of unique and specialty engineering skills, and knowledge and integration of all those elements into a very vast supply chain that, uh, that feeds our transformation in the factory and uh, in the engineering communities. Those are the elements, some key elements, that help prepare us for the future workforce to compete effectively in a really, really rapidly changing environment. Understanding, accessing, analyzing, protecting, and utilizing data will be hugely significant as we continue to discover new disruptive drivers and technology. Not to be understated, but the talent and the search and the competition is fierce. Not just here in our local region and not just across the national stage, but this is across the entire globe. Connecting the skills necessary to the implementation of automation and robotics is going to be crucial for our business and other industry leaders as well. Boeing's going to continue to be, take reactive and proactive approaches to manage a very dynamic workforce environment, addressing the critical skill shortages that we have, such as in the pilot community, as well as our own factory workers, uh, both internally to our business and externally to the markets that we currently serve and have yet to serve in the future. Our performance throughout the use of uh, automation and robotics while addressing the very competitive business nature is going to be key for us to continue our next century uh, for Boeing. So thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Rudy, and uh, thank you so much for uh, the participation of two great speakers as well ahead of uh, Rudy. I'd like to open up the floor for questions uh, for the speakers. I'd like to maybe throw a, a question in, and, and one question for the panel is, uh, is technology lagging or leading the adoption of automation and robotics? Meaning, are we ahead of technology in adapting it, or is technology ahead and we're still trying to catch up and automate things that should be automated, but they're not there quite yet? Well, is it on? Okay. I'm sure there is not uh, one, one answer to that question. Uh, let me address the question from the perspective of, um, of ports and terminals. Um, I think that um, the industry I'm working in um, is an industry that is more, let's say, a follower than a leader. Um, so. It took uh, a long time before, let's say, automation and robotization was adopted and accepted. Um, well, earlier there was a talk about accents. Well, my accent is a Dutch accent, so I'm from the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, um, we started automating our ports back in 1993. So that's quite a long time ago, and that was quite innovative. So in, in that perspective, I think, um, that was ahead of the curve, having automated guided vehicles and, and robots in that scale already in that time. Um, but now you see that um, in, in, in the terminal industry, uh, more and more people realize that um, the benefits of automation to make sure that you have a safer environment, that you have a more, um, uh, let's say, a place where people can, can, can work. And it's not only about, let's say, eliminating jobs, but I think what also the other speakers conveyed is a clear message. It's not about eliminating, it's about shifting. It's about another way of, of, of working. And it's about creating new opportunities for people. And of course, I mean, for the people directly involved, this is something that, um, that, that needs to be managed uh, in, a, in a very, um, well, with 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 a lot of lot of sense, and I think um, uh, Nicholas um, 
I had an, uh, a perfect example of that. But yeah, that's how I perceive it, and probably others want to react as well on this. Yeah, so in terms of uh, technology um, and which drives the other, um, at Applied Medical um, on the automation team, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, we use a lot of sensors on our machinery to detect, you know, where our product is, you know, inside the machine, uh, what state the machine is in. Um, and a lot of these sensors can be very either complex or they can be very expensive. And we constantly have um, sensor vendors coming in and um, asking us how can we improve on, you know, sensing, you know, doing this kind of sensor. And we give our feedback and they, they actually do listen. Um, you know, can we combine, you know, like what these two sensors do together into one, you know, and actually do it for cheaper? And again, by making um, our machines cheaper and we're able to reduce our costs and it allows us to keep manufacturing local. So I think it does a little bit of both. Like we use the existing technology that's out there, but we also give our feedback and input into the, new, the newer technology that's out there. Thanks, Nicholas. Uh, similar to Nicholas's answer, uh, from a Boeing perspective, we're probably on both sides of that equation. Uh, we have some fantastic products, very complex products that are flying today, uh, composite wings, composite fuselage that are out there in revenue service today. Uh, fantastic technology, but on the same token, we have so much opportunity in front of us as well. We're just exploring the additive manufacturing. We're just now exploring the analytics, uh, tapping into data lakes to be able to really bring that data and that knowledge and information to where we need to to drive those proactive or predictive uh, activities that we need to get to. So we're on both sides of the equation as well. Uh, we've got a lot to learn. Uh, like I said, there's, uh, we're extremely proud of our heritage being 100 years old, but being 100 years old also puts a certain mindset in with people that we've always done it a certain way. So we've got to change mindsets as well. And that's as much a directive that we have in our company as understanding new technology. It's about changing the human capital and the human mindset to look at things differently, to be innovative. And on top of that, certainly from a commercial standpoint, we have to bring the regulators along with us. They have to understand it. They have to be comfortable with it. We have to be able to convince them that it is safe, that we have all the right elements necessary to be able to implement this technology going forward. Thank you, panelists. Questions from the audience? Yes, uh, right here. So, Rudy, you mentioned that uh, automated flight decks uh, came in, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago. And uh, one of the things that the I know that the FAA has had concerns that that automation has basically taken away pilots paying attention. Um, and I was wondering, Nicholas, do you see any parallels of that same problem with surgeons, for instance, in the medical industry that we have seen in the aerospace industry? Um, I can't speak directly to the robotics on the, sur on the surgery side, because uh, I'm more on the, the manufacturing side of stuff. Um, but I do understand your perspective of, um, of not paying attention, right? So like, um, for us, uh, when we have a manual manufacturing process, um, our team members that are putting it together are um, our operators are n our team members are no longer taking a look at our products as closely as they as they used to. Um, so part of how we mitigate that is we um, introduce new quality processes into it. Um, so we develop either vision systems. Um, um, and sometimes we just need to have our team members that are there that are looking, you know, during the manufacturing process. Um, and so it, it is a little difficult to, to get that quality back, right, um, with the paying attention and, and taking a look. Um, but it's, it's, it's our ownership um, to be able to uh, train and develop, you know, our production team members and implement the processes that are necessary to be able to keep that quality. If you have a question back here, I'll bring the microphone. I have a question for uh, Rudy. 
you mentioned um, you guys are doing a lot of automation products. What is the feature of the Boeing 747-8? I know a lot of uh, companies are retiring their 747 fleet. This is my favorite airplane. One of mine, too. 747-8 uh, uh, produced a course up in Seattle. Comes in a couple of different configurations. There's a passenger version, and there's a freighter version. Uh, we, and that airplane reacts much like other airplanes to what's happening in the market, what's happening in the environment. Lately, the freight market overall environment has been down, but it, uh, there is some uh, trends that is picking up uh, going forward. So we view the Dash 8 as a, a key component of that. It is very, very attractive in certain market segments going forward, uh, but it's uh, part of an equation, of a bigger equation, taking a look at where is the industry going from a freight haul and a uh, market delivery perspective. Again, you saw a couple of illustrations, a couple of concepts that may be able to uh, deliver freight more effectively, more efficiently, certainly with not as, uh, with, without the flight crew, but there's also opportunities and we've done some studies and some checks to figure out can we uh, automate our current flight crews, our current cockpits to be able to use the existing structure. So it is part of an overarching equation. We hope to continue building the 747-8, certainly more from a freighter perspective than a passenger con configuration. Thank you, Rudy. Other questions back here? Uh, I have two questions. The first one is a uh, gentleman from the port. Uh, you, may, uh, you indicated that uh, 90, uh, your automated port is 90% automated and 10% not automated. I'm wondering what's 10% is, if you like to share uh, yeah, details. Thank, thank you for the question. So um, if you look at uh, processes today, um, what is not automated, because that's the 10%, so that's easier to uh, explain, the interaction with the outside world so the, inter the direct interaction with the vessel, for example, is not automated. So you see that um, the cycle is for 90% automated, but then let's say the final, the final pickup or the final descent uh, and the interaction with the vessel is not automated. Technically, it can be done. Uh, more from a responsibility and liability perspective, there are some hurdles to take. And at the other end, the same goes for uh, automated truck handling. Um, in Europe, it's automated. Uh, so from a technical perspective, it can be done. Here in the US, the final handling and the interaction, let's say the last um, uh, meter to do the final descent and, and, uh, and hand off to the, uh, to the truck is not automated. Again. It's not so much a technical issue, it's more a liability and a responsibility issue. Okay, thank you. And another question is a gentleman from Boeing. Uh, and so it looks like Boeing is trying to automate uh, pro uh, manufacturing of the airplane. Now, did that automation change the design of the airplane uh, significantly or the design of uh, airplane is still kind of independent from manufacturing? Typically it is independent from manufacturing, but those two have to be coupled together. We have to go through, as we work through our technology readiness, uh, oftentimes it's very easy to get swayed more towards the product itself. Is the product ready? Is the technology ready to go implement? Uh, sometimes what we fail to do is recognizing, is our factory ready? Is the tool suite ready? Uh, all right, so all those readiness elements have to come together. Uh, they work independently, but in concert as well as you ensure that you've got an integrated view for that entire product line. Thank you, Rudy and Bart. One more question. We'll take one more question. I'll go on the far side back here because we haven't been down there yet. Okay, hi, um, I'm an engineering student and I'm graduating this year. I have, so I guess I'm wondering, 
What advice do you have to graduates and students um, wanting to get into these industries like manufacturing or automation or the aerospace industry? Any advice? Anybody? <laughs> uh, so at Applied Medical, uh, we're a very young company and we bring a lot of uh, incoming engineers um, from all, all over, um, all, actually all over the US. And um, there's a few things that we really do look for in, um, in candidates, you know, and bringing them into, um, especially the automation team. Uh, one is that curiosity and drive, right? Is do you have that, that mindset to think of like, how does this work, right? Or if, if I had this project that I had done in the past, if I were to do it all over again, what would I have done differently? Right, like, I, of course, we all run into problems when we're, you know, doing these projects. But looking back, you know, how would you improve on it? Right, um, having uh, other projects or side stuff. Like we ask about hobbies all the time, right? And um, a lot of people are like, oh yeah, they're like, so I have an Arduino at home, you know, and I tinker around on that, or they're like, I'm building like, you know, the the head of a robot, you know, and trying to get it to blink right now. And then we like to dive into those types of projects. You know, we want to hear what is it that you do on your free time? Or what is it that you do like um, as part of like extracurriculars, you know, outside of class, you know? Because it really shows us like how you think, you know, what, uh, do you, are you curious, you know? And, and do you really have that drive and motivation that we're looking for, you know, to drive this industry forward? So I'm with Moffat and Nickel, and if you look at our website, you see Moffat and Nickel, and it is about um, a practical solution and about crea creative people. And that's really, um, I think, important. Do you want to be, let's say, part of the problem or being part of the solution? So it is, it is a lot is about, I mean, skills are, of course, very important, but being flexible and being willing to be, let's say, part of the solution, work as a team, look at uh, issues that arise and make sure that you're able to look at it from the different angles, be flexible and agile. I think that's something that is really, really important nowadays. So great points and totally support what they say. Uh, the generation coming out of school today you guys think differently, and that's a good thing. And we need to harness that different thought process, that different mindset. You communicate differently than some of us are used to communicating. That brings a new, uh, a diverse element to how we do things. We are very focused on innovation. We're very focused on bringing that mindset, unlocking that innovation where we need to because of those new markets that we have yet to tap into. So we rely on that skill set. Uh, we know that you've been... Uh, given that opportunity here, and as you graduate, uh, we look forward to those opportunities to bring in that skill set to bring all of you with us to think about this industry and the way we have in the last 20 years. So let's engage and do it again. Thank you. And I'd like to thank our panelists for taking so much of their valuable time to join us. Uh, Dingle Shani for hosting us. I'd like to thank our sponsors, AES, P2S, Port of Long Beach, and Mr. Michael and uh, Mrs. Linda Nigley for sponsoring this great event. Uh, and thank you all for participating. Um, once again, honored to uh, be given the opportunity to come back to my school and be part of the process that's going to take us forward into uh, the next part of the 21st century. I think, as you can see, this school is interested in bringing forth the technologies and the knowledge necessary for all of us to participate in progress to participate in the workforce as is going to be shaped going forward. So thank you, thank you all very much. And I'd like to make sure that we all save the date for the next lecture, which is taking place on March 15th, 2018. And the activities are already ongoing to make sure that we have another interesting set of topics as well as great speakers to join us for the next lecture. Uh, if the Dean or Nicole would like to say anything else, please uh, let me know. If not, thank you so very much. Dean?
Just wanted to add my thanks to you for moderating the panel and the speakers for a very engaging and enjoyable event again. Uh, do we have presentations that we will present to uh, our uh, speakers? And thank you all very much. See you in March for another uh, great topic. Thank you.